Okay, so uh, first of all, I'd like to thank the organizers, uh, Pablo Guarino and Cesar Pacifico, for this uh, kind invitation. It's a great pleasure to be here. It's, it's actually an honor to be a part of the celebration of Wellington's uh, 70th birthday. Uh, yesterday, I heard Sebastian say that he's known uh, Wellington forever. Okay, so uh, I haven't known him uh, quite as long, uh, but let's say forever minus the square root of epsilon. I met Wellington before I was actually a graduate student, and uh, in fact, Wellington was responsible for introducing me to uh, Dennis Sullivan, who was later my advisor. And through the years, uh, he used to go to, to New York and also to Paris when I was a graduate student, and uh, I, every time he went, he, he really tried to press Dennis to give uh, details of his renormalization theory, and he's largely responsible for Dennis actually uh, putting, putting in the details and this was very good for me because my, in my thesis I had to use these uh, uh, ideas of Sullivan and uh, it was thanks to Wellington that I was able to uh, learn most of it. Uh, so I probably would not have finished my thesis if not for, for Wellington's uh, presence. And uh, uh, soon afterwards we started working, uh, maybe one or two years after I finished we started working and we had a collaboration that went, went on for quite a number of years. We wrote a few papers, a couple of books, and I learned a great deal from, from, from Wellington, from his, uh, you know, his, uh, his constant drive, his, uh, uh, you know, his pursuit of you know, excellence, and his working ethics, and uh, uh, above all, his uh, intellectual honesty, which I really appreciate very much. So it's really an honor, so happy birthday, Wellington. So uh, I apologize to those of you who uh, were present in Imperial College at uh, Sebastian's celebration. This talk will be mostly a repetition of what I uh, said there. Uh, so I, I would like to start by explaining a few words in the title. So the word rigidity has appeared uh, so many times already uh, at the conference that I don't think I need to explain, but like we saw in this previous beautiful talk by, 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 by Bjorn, uh, rigidity in dynamics usually means that you have some equivalence, uh, weak equivalence between two dynamical systems, and you would like to know under a minimal set of uh, hypotheses uh, whether you, you know, this weak equivalence implies a strong equivalence between the two systems. So, uh, weak usually means that you have the same topological data or the same combinatorial data. Uh, strong equivalence means that you, you know, the uh, geometry at small scales of your systems are the same. So this is a, a concept that was borrowed uh, f uh, from geometry, from the work of Mostow in the late 40s on homogeneous space. It's a beautiful story, but of course I'm not going to go into that, especially since we have already uh, had, you know, at least uh, two other talks, you know, uh, uh, Misha's talk and uh, Bjorn's talk talking about this. So um, I'm interested in rigidity in the context of uh, circle homeomorphisms. The um, uh, primary example is given by the Arnold family. Uh, here, uh, alpha, as you move alpha from, you know, if you fix beta and you move alpha from 0 to 1, the rotation number uh, increases. If you make beta less than 1, strictly less than 1, then you have a diffeomorphism, an analytic diffeomorphism. If you, if you make beta equal to 1, you have a uh, you know, x equals zero becomes a, a, a critical point of cubic type. So that's the sort of prototype for uh, the theory. But I would like to, uh, you know, the, the goal here would be eventually to get to the situation where we, we, you know, we add more Fourier modes here, adjust the parameters so that we have, you know, more critical points, two, three, four, five, six, as many critical points as you want. And uh, you'd like to study the rigidity properties of such, uh, such uh, dynamical systems. So I call these uh, critical circle maps. I will be calling them multi-critical circle maps if they have two or more uh, critical points. Um, so let me just start by saying that the model in this uh, area, you know, the, the proto, you know, the ideal theorem in this area is uh, given by, by, by this uh, result of Hermann and Yoko's, which is very informally stated here. Um, so uh, the theorem is uh, stated as follows. If you, if you have a, a diffeomorphism of the circle and it's a smooth, I'm not saying how smooth it is, uh, 
if the rotation number is irrational of diophantine type, then uh, uh, this, this diffio will always be uh, smoothly conjugate to the corresponding rotation with the same rotation number. Uh, I'm being vague here about smooth. You know, you, you, could, you could state this theorem in various smoothness categories. You could say it's CK, then the conjugacy will be uh, slightly less than CK minus one. There will be a little bit that you lose, and the, the little bit that you lose has to do with how diophantine the, the rotation number is, okay? So this is like the ideal theorem. You really, you, you get the conjugacy to be almost as smooth as your dynamical system, okay? Now, we want to study the case when you have critical points. So I'll, I'll skip this. Uh, there is a very nice history here, you know, the, the, the theorem by Hermann and Yokos, there, you know, it started with Arnold's thesis. There were contributions after Hermann and Yokos by Katz, Nelson, and Ornstein. There is a renormalization approach that's due to uh, Yaroslav Stark. There's work by Hanning, who's present here, and Sinai using a thermodynamic formalism to study these maps. And there's a lot of other stuff which I'm not uh, uh, stating there. But th this is the case where ma the maps don't have critical points. We are interested in the case where they do. So we are interested in the case or when I said what happens when beta equals to one, I actually, I actually mean what happens when beta is equal to one, okay? So there's a lot of work that has been done in the, the last uh, three, uh, three or four decades about these maps. Um, and they amount to proving rigidity theorems for this, uh, for this map. So I, I want to state the state of the art, so to speak, in this area for one critical point. But first I, I need to give you some, remind you of some notions about circle homeomorphisms, right? So there is this invariant called the rotation number that uh, you saw yesterday in Liviana's talk. Uh, you take a point on the circle, start iterating under your map, and basically the rotation number counts the average number of turns that you uh, give around the circle as you go along. Uh, this rotation number uh, can be expanded in a continued fraction like, like that. And this continued fraction can be finite or infinite depending on whether the rotation number is rational or irrational. I'm only interested in the irrational case when there are no periodic points. And um, in that case, if you truncate the expansion at a certain level n and you write the resulting uh, number as a rational in re irreducible form, pn over qn, then the QNs uh, have a dynamical meaning that I'm going to give you in the next slide. They satisfy a recurrence relation, which is this one. All of this is very classical, very well known. So what's important here is to understand the dynamical interpretation of these QNs. These QNs, they are like closest approaches of the orbit of any point to, to itself, uh, closest in the combinatorial sense. So if you think of a rotation, of a rigid rotation, then this sequence of QNs is really uh, has this property. It's characterized by the property that, you know, FQN is of X is the closest point up to that time than all previous iterates. Okay? So, uh, so you can define, uh, well, it's also known that these returns, they alternate around the, the, uh, the point X for any X you pick. I'm thinking again, there are no periodic points. Okay? So, Rotation number is irrational, so the sequence of QNs is infinite. So, um, so these are the closest returns, and with using the closest returns, you can define uh, a sequence of intervals around any point x. I sub n of x is defined like uh, an interval with endpoints x and f q n of x in such a way that it's the, the interval with those two uh, uh, vertices that contains the point f q n plus two. Okay. So this defines completely what these isobands are, and they, these, these isobands also alternate around x, okay? So uh, using these intervals, you can define a partition of the circle at each level. You take these two intervals, two consecutive intervals, uh, by, determined by two consecutive cl uh, closest returns, i sub n and i sub n, uh, sub, sub n plus one, uh, this interval here is called long, a long interval, and all of its iterates are called long intervals. The, this one is called a short interval, and all of its uh, uh, iterates are also called short. Uh, they are called long and short because for rotations, they are precisely, you know, th this guy is going to be uh, longer than this one, okay? So you iterate them, you iterate the long, the long interval up to the short time, uh, sorry, uh, up to the long time, and the uh, short interval up to the short time, okay? 
So these iterates form a partition of the unit circle modulo endpoints. Uh, I call them the end dynamical partition. Uh, so you have a sequence of partitions, and uh, uh, as you will see uh, in a moment, these partitions, the mesh of these partitions, the largest uh, intervals in each one of these partitions, the largest, largest length that you see as a function of n goes to zero as n goes to infinity, okay? So uh, what are multi-critical circle maps? So let me give you a formal definition. So for me, it's going to be an orientation-preserving homeo of the circle with finitely many critical points uh, of power law type. So there is this exponent, S uh, sub i greater than 1, uh, just like in uh, the previous talk. So you have a, um, at each critical point, you have a, you know, the derivative is squeezed between two power laws like this. So this, in fact, tells you that F has a critical point of type SI at the, at the critical point CI. So there are finitely many of those, right? Because, you know, you have power laws. Power laws are isolated uh, singularities, so uh, the circle is compact, so there can be only finitely many of those. Um, I will assume that near each one of these critical points, the map has negative Schwarzschild derivative. And uh, this third condition here is really superfluous. It's a consequence of the rest of the definition. Away from the critical points, you expect, I mean, you should have uh, the map having this property that the log of the derivative has bounded variation. Okay, so the uh, exponents that appear here are just called the power law exponents or just critical exponents at each critical point. So these are the maps we are uh, going to study. And uh, there is a topological classification of such maps. This is given by Yoko's theorem um, from 1984. It's a very nice paper which is only four pages long. You know, it's on compte rendu. And he proves this uh, very nice uh, result that, you know, uh, these maps do not have wandering domains, okay? And this was actually the first time that, uh, um, uh, you know, someone used uh, uh, distortion of cross ratios to prove something in one dimensional dynamics. This was later made into a huge tool by Sebastian and, and, and Wellington, okay? Uh, the cross ratio that Yokos uses here is like a degenerate cross ratio, it's not really you know, the usual cross ratios that we see uh, these days. But anyway, so that's the topological classification. So this tells you that the rotation number completely classifies these maps. So now you're interested in uh, understanding the rigidity properties of these. So I need to explain the word quasi-symmetric quasi in the title, quasi-symmetry. So, um, uh, so I think most of you will know, but in any case, let me define it. So a homeomorphism is quasi-symmetric if, uh, if you take three equally, any three equally spaced points in the domain and you look at the images, the, the ratio of the lengths of the two intervals determined by the image, the ratios are bounded, okay, independently of the three points that you take. So it distorts uh, ratios of three equally spaced points by, by a bounded amount, okay? These, uh, these are very well-known uh, homeomorphisms. They appear... Outside, you know, they, they appeared first outside of the scope of dynamics as boundary values of quasi-conformal maps. And they are, uh, the, the problem is that they're usually very, very bad with, you know, from the differentiable viewpoint. They're usually uh, purely singular with respect to the bag measure, okay? So uh, I want to uh, explain also the word rigidity, right? So I, I, I'm actually going to speak about a weak form of rigidity, which is quasi-symmetric rigidity. But there is a strategy that was laid down by Sullivan to achieve rigidity. I mean, uh, we saw in the previous talk that this paradigm may, has its limitations, right? But in any case, uh, the strategy goes as follows. I mean, this is a very, very, very coarse description and very imprecise description of what, uh, uh, what was uh, the, the proposal by Sullivan. So, so his idea is that, you know, if you have a system which is, say, real analytic, so everything I'm going to talk in this slide is about real analytic systems. So, uh, First, you should get real a priori bounds on the critical orbits, okay? Then there's this general uh, sort of ansatz that the geometry of the critical orbits should determine the geometry of all other orbits for one dimensional system, okay? Um, so then you use the real bounds this, that you get on the, on the critical orbits to get some minor regularity for the conjugacy. So you make the conjugacy go from topological to, uh, say, quasi-symmetric. 
Okay? So there's a mild regularity. This is very mild, really. Like I said, quasi-symmetric homeomorphisms are very bad from the differential viewpoint, but they, at least they're holder. They're like holder continuous. So once you have that, you, uh, your systems are real analytic, so they have a complex analytic extension to some neighborhood of, uh, of the, the interval or the, or, the real, or the circle, right? So you, you complexify your dynamical system. You get a complex dynamical system around the real line or around the circle. Uh, and you try to promote these real bounds that you have to complex bounds for this complex analytic system. This usually amounts to getting control on moduli of certain annuli. Uh, so these are the so-called complex bounds. Uh, and then lurking beneath this, this discussion, there is a notion of renormalization. So in the specific case of circle maps, I didn't tell you this, but you know, I, I mentioned that there were these um, two, let me draw the picture first and then I, so there's, here's the critical, say one of the critical points, let me call it C0. And here are the uh, two closest returns to it. So there's FQN plus one of C0. There's FQN of C0. And you can consider the first return map to this, to the, to, to, to this critical point. So then what you're gonna get, if you have various critical points, usually it's going to be something that looks more or less like this. Okay? So you may have uh, various critical points besides, besides the one where you're looking, where you're focusing your attention. So uh, this notion, this notion of uh, uh, closest, uh, uh, retur you know, first return map is the notion of renormalization that I'm talking about here. So uh, you expect to be able to extend this renormalization operator, which is defined for the real dynamics to the complex dynamics. And you also hope to be able to put some structure on the space of complex dynamical systems in such a way that your operator becomes nice, becomes like a, uh, say, a holomorphic operator or a real analytic operator. And then you hope to apply something like a Schwarz lemma to prove that uh, uh, these renormalizations, you know, if you take any two such maps and you renormalize, 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 they, they kind of go together, you know, they converge exponentially, ex exponentially fast to, to one another. If, they, if you start with maps which are topologically conjugate. So, uh, of course, uh, this is a very brief and very coarse description of what the strategy should be. The deepest parts are, of course, three, four, and five. And in the case of unimodal maps, for instance, the work that is being done here besides uh, Sullivan, you know, there's fantastic work by McMullen, uh, the theory of towers to get exponential contraction. The, the most subtle part is really getting this right holomorphic structure. That's the work of Lubitsch. You know, and he, he really gets the operator to be, to be a, a complex analytic, and then he can really apply, you know, really show that it's hyperbolic, okay? So it's very deep. And there is, of, of course, so, uh, also uh, the work of uh, uh, Avila and Lubitsch, which uh, later uh, uh, refined these things and really extended uh, uh, the results. So this is, there's a beautiful story here but I'm not going to talk about this. I'm going to just try to show to you that so far for multi-critical circle maps, all we can do is steps one and two, okay? We know nothing about how to complexify. So for instance, if you're given a map like this, what is the right complex analytic extension of these, uh, these maps to a neighborhood of uh, uh, interval, okay? So we don't really know. I mean, we haven't really worked it out, so. In the unicritical case, when there is only one critical point, so there's just this critical point, so these branches here don't have critical points in the return maps. Uh, I'll, I'll state for you the sort of state of the art of the, of the theory, okay? So, um, so this is for uh, 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 critical circle maps which have one critical point with a power law of odd type, so like three, five, seven, and so on, okay? So the theorem says that if you have two uh, such maps, and they are at least C4, uh, the same irrational rotation number, and only one critical point of this type, the same type, the same power law. Uh, so then the topological conjugacy that you have between these maps is actually uh, a C1 diffeo, okay? And moreover, if, if for, a, for a certain full Lebeg measure uh, set of uh, rotation numbers, the conjugacy is, is slightly better. It's actually C1 plus alpha for some alpha greater than zero, okay? 
at the same time, if you lower the differentiability from C4 to C3, then you can at least say that in the bounded type case, when the ANs of the continuous fraction expansion are bounded, uh, you, have, uh, you have C1 plus alpha conjugate, conjugate C4, a universal alpha. So you have this C1 plus alpha rigidity, okay? These results with finite differentiability are due, you know, this one is due to uh, Pablo Guarino with uh, Wellington and, and also Marco Martins. This one is coming from Pablo's thesis and also a joint paper with Wellington. Okay, but the, 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 I didn't put the names, their names here, because these theorems are actually the culmination of a long story, which, which I'm not going to tell you, but I'm just going to mention that there are names of various people attached to, this, to these theorems, okay? So there is first the topological work by, uh, I mean, the settling of the topology by Yokos, and also some ge geometric estimates that he made, the so-called Yokos uh, lemma, which I'll mention later, which is fundamental in this area. There is also the work of Hermann and Schwiontek showing, uh, among other things, uh, bounded geometry. And then there's work by, by Wellington and myself, and, and also by Jan Polsky and Kamlev and Hani and Teplinski, uh, and uh, most re recently, uh, Guarino and also Marco, okay? And I should say that for this statement here, there is a, uh, I mean, this is just for bounded type. So you ask, well, what happens if you don't have bounded type? Then there are counterexamples to C1 plus alpha rigidity. These, in the C infinity setting, these were first obtained by Wellington and, and I. Uh, in the analytic setting, real analytic setting, they were obtained by, by Artur Avila, okay? So this is the situation for one, for maps with one critical point. So I'd like to talk about what happens when you have more critical points. So when you have more critical points, you still have only one topological invariant, which is the rotation number. But now you, are, you have also a measured theoretic invariant that you have to take into account, OK? Uh, so if you have two uh, multi-critical circle maps with the same number of critical points, and you know that there is a C1 conjugacy between them, OK? Well, first of all, the types at corresponding critical points have to be the same, okay? Moreover, the circle, when you have a critical, multi-critical circle map, the circle is divided up into uh, finitely many pieces. So here are the critical points. So these arcs, these arcs have certain measures. There is a, th th these maps are uniquely ergodic, so there is a unique invariant measure for these maps. So if you look at this invariant measure and you measure the, you know, the sizes of these arcs in this measure, these numbers are also invariant. If you have two such maps and they are C1 conjugate, conjugate the conjugacy has to, has to take the measure to the measure of each one of these arcs, okay? So these are invariants. These are C1 invariants. And uh, I call them, you know, if I put them all together, I call them the signature of, uh, of your map. So the signature is the rotation number, the number of critical points, the power laws at each, uh, each one of the critical points, and the measures of these arcs between critical points, okay? I'm labeling the critical points so, so that they, they, they are ordered on the circle, say, uh, and, uh, counterclockwise, if you will, okay? So then the conjecture, of, of course, you know, I said that if you have a C1 conjugacy between two such maps, then the, uh, they, they must have the same signature, right? So the conjecture is that the con converse works, uh, holds. So if, if you... If you, uh, if you have uh, uh, um, uh, two multi-critical circle maps with the same signature, then they are uh, C1 conjugate, okay? And you also expect a result uh, 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 um, for bounded type. You expect the conjugacy to be slightly better than, than C1 again, okay? I should say that I'm stating it here C3. If you look, there is a discrepancy because in the theorem there is a C4 here. But presumably, the C4 is really, uh, let's, see, let's say, a, a limitation of maybe the method of proof, but not really you know, what you should expect. You should expect C3 here also, but you know, we don't know that yet, okay? So in the multi-critical case, I, I'm stating it as C3, so this would be the conjecture. Anyway, so, so what, what can we do in the multi-critical case? So like I said, we can only do steps one and two of Sullivan's uh, strategy, okay? So step one has been around for a long time. It's a theorem due to Hermann and Schiantek, and it just gives you, the, you know, gives you this bounded geometry statement. So if you look at these partitions, the di dynamical partitions that I defined before, uh, 
um, than uh, any two adjacent atoms at the same level, at the same partition, Pn, are comparable. Okay? Uh, this constant here may depend on the map F, but then later you can prove that it's actually asymptotically independent of F. As you go, you know, as you look at Pn with n very large, the ratios of adjacent intervals become comparable by a constant that does not depend on, on, on F anymore, okay? This is in fact, uh, so in, in particular, uh, so here's one of the critical points. Uh, by the way, I should mention this. This is for any critical point that you pick. I mean, there, there are many, many critical points now to choose from, okay? And these partitions for different uh, critical points, they, they're not coherent at all. They're, I mean, well, they're sort of coherent. They're like this, okay? Anyway. So, um, so we, uh, in particular, we have this picture. This, this picture is actually fundamental for proving the, 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 the theorem. You know, if first you prove that these six intervals that you see in the picture are comparable. Once you do that, you kind of propagate using cross-racial distortion and uh, maybe a little bit of Kerber distortion and so on. You, 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 you get the statement, okay? But the, the fundamental thing is to get this picture. Now, uh, we, we, Pablo and uh, Gabriela, Esteves and I, we wrote a, a short note recently showing that these bounds are really bow in the sense of Sullivan. So bow means bounds of this type I just mentioned. They are asymptotically independent of the map that you're taking, okay? So we did that, but that's not new, not so new. The main theorem I want to uh, report is this one, which is with uh, Gabriela, okay? So uh, it's saying that if you have two multicritical circle maps and they have the same irrational rotation number and uh, you know that uh, there is a homeomorphism conjugating both of them in such a way that the conjugacy maps critical points to critical points, okay? So it establishes a one-to-one -one correspondence between critical points. Then the conjugacy must be quasi-symmetric, okay? Notice that I'm not uh, requiring that the signatures are really the same. I'm not requiring that the power laws are the same at the critical points, okay? This is not necessary. Uh, by the way, we, are, we do not assume that the power laws are integers. They can be any real number. E each critical exponent can be a real number greater than one. It doesn't, doesn't really matter if it's an integer or not. For integ integral criticalities, this theorem is actually a, 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 a corollary of a much more general uh, 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 result by, by, by Trevor Clark and, and Sebastian Venstrin, which... Uh, uh, which is really encompassing uh, both uh, multimodal maps and, and multi-critical circle maps and all, and all that. Uh, they prove a quasi-symmetric rigidity theorem there. But their proof uses complex analytic methods. Okay? We are using just real variable methods. We, 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 the, you know, the, we only use the distortion of cross ratios, the Schwarz, and, and nothing else. Okay? So, but of course, we are getting much less than what we would like. I mean, we are, we are getting just the steps one and two of uh, Sullivan's uh, strategy, okay? And uh, this issue about non-integral power loss came up in the previous talk also. This is not just generalizing for the sake of generalizing. Non-integral power laws are important because they appear, for instance, in things like uh, 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 the study of the Lorentz flow, right? So they, they appear as, you know, if you study cross sections of the Lorentz flow, these maps, there will be these maps with uh, uh, various uh, uh, power laws, okay? So uh, let me show you a corollary of these two theorems. There is this bow bounds here and this theorem. Uh, they have a following corollary. So in fact, not only are you know, any two such maps, if there is a topological conjugacy between, between them, taking critical points to critical points, not only is the conjugacy quasi-symmetric, but asymptotically the quasi-symmetric distortion becomes bounded. Okay. So in the, in the language of renormalization, this would say that if you start renormalizing around any one of the critical points, these return maps, they will be such that, you know, for, there, there'll be the one return map here for F, another corresponding one for G. The conjugacy between them becomes uh, quasi-symmetric with bounded K. So this is like saying that the renormalizations are kind of going to a, a bounded uh, uh, domain in the space of uh, maps, okay? So, uh, 
this is stated precisely in this fashion. Uh, the, the, the conjugacy is quasi-symmetric and it, its local quasi-symmetric distortion is universally bounded. So what, what do I mean by local quasi-symmetric distortion? I just mean, you know, you look at a point, you look at triples of points centered at that point, you know, very tiny, and you look at the distortion of the ratios by, by the conjugacy. You take the limb soup of that uh, at small scale, make the scale go down to zero. That's the local quasi-symmetric distortion. Okay, and I'm saying that this is bounded. H, in principle, yes, yes, it could, could, could it could be singular with respect to Lebesgue measure. Okay, but it doesn't matter. I mean, uh, but it will not be conjecturally because you know the, the conjecture is that if the two maps have the same signature, it's actually a C1 diffeo. Okay. Anyway, so let me also show that there is a breakdown of uh, quasi symmetry. This is the new thing that was not present in my talk at. Uh, uh, imperial because basically because Pablo and I worked this out during the meeting so anyway so we have counterexamples to quasi-symmetric rigidity when you this is really to expect to be expected when you have different numbers of critical points for instance if you have a map with one critical point and you have another map with the same rotation number but with two critical points you, you might still ask I mean are they quasi-symmetrically conjugate you see there is a case where they are I mean if the rotation number is of bounded type any two such maps will always be quasi-symmetrically conjugate if they have that rotation number. Because by a theorem of Hermann and Schiontek, maps with a bounded type rotation number are topologically conjugate to the corresponding rotation. So they are conjugate to one another. Okay? So you might, in fact, quasi-symmetrically conjugate to one another. So you might ask, uh, is the conjugacy quasi-symmetric, you know, can the conjugacy be quasi-symmetric in general? And uh, this result we have shows that it, it cannot. So, so uh, we look at the, uh, this class of rotation numbers for which all the convergence of the rotation number are even, and there is at least some subsequence of the ANs going to infinity. So it's not bounded type. This set is unfortunately very small from the point of view of Lebesgue measure. It has Lebesgue measure zero. But we prove that there is a residual set containing the set with the property that if you have any two, you know, if you have, so, so, so that if you take any uh, number in this, in this class, in this B, you can find two maps, one with one critical point, another with uh, two critical points, both are C infinity smooth, okay? They both have that rotation number, and the conjugacy that maps one critical, the, the unique critical point of one of the maps to one of the two critical points of the other is not quasi-symmetric, cannot be quasi-symmetric. We can show that this set is residual, but w w this is still work in progress. We believe that we can actually show that this set is full measure, okay? So, uh, but we don't have that yet, okay? I, 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 if I have time, and I don't know if I do have time, I will try to get, at least give you an idea of how this uh, theorem is proved. So, uh, so, so what, uh, now I've given all the statements I wanted, so let me just give you some flavor, you know, some ingredients in the proofs, okay? So first we need a criterion for a homeomorphism to be quasi-symmetric. And for this criterion, I need a definition. So I define a fine grid. This is something that already appears in uh, my first paper with Wellington. A fine grid is a sequence of partitions of the unit circle, which have the property that each partition strictly refines the previous one in the sequence. And each atom of, uh, at a given level, when you go to the next level, it's broken into boundedly many atoms. And these boundedly many atoms all have comparable lengths with the one which contains it. Okay? So uh, there's two constants here. There's the, you know, the, number of, the maximum number of intervals in which an atom is broken from one step to the next. And there is also this comparability constant between neighbors. You have to be very careful with this because you know, if you start with an interval, suppose you're trying to build a fine grid w w without any dynamics. So you, if you start with an interval, say the interval 0, 1, and you break it into two pieces, and then you start doing things like, well, now I'm going, on this side, I'm going to always divide by 2, by 2, by 2, by 2 equal pieces. And on this side, I always divide by 3, by 3, by 3. This will not give you a, a fine grid, okay? Because here in the middle, you always, you know, at the nth level, you have on one side an interval of length 2 to the minus n, 
And at the other, uh, the other side, you have a, a, an interval of length 3 to the minus n, which is much smaller. The ratio is not comparable. So the way these fine grids are constructed is kind of subtle, okay? even if you don't have a, a, any dynamics to, to play with. So. But here's a criterion. Suppose you have a fine grid, and you have a homeomorph homeomorphism that doesn't distort this fine grid too much. So in other words, if you take any two adjacent atoms of the fine grid at the same level, and you look at the ratio of the lengths, and you look at the ratio of the lengths of their images, these two things are bounded, a bounded distance apart. Okay, but there is a uniform constant uh, lambda for which this, this happens at every level. Okay? Then the homeomorphism must be quasi-symmetric. And in fact, the quasi-symmetric constant depends only on those constants of the fine grid and also on this lambda here. Okay? All right. So uh, it, it, another way of saying this is the following. Suppose you have two fine grids and you have a, a, a homeomorphism, which is an isomorphism of fine grids, takes atoms to atoms at each level, then it's quasi-symmetric, okay? And conversely, if you have a, a fine grid and you have a, a quasi-symmetric map and you look at the image of the uh, fine grid by a quasi-symmetric map, it will be a fine grid also, okay? So in order to show that the conjugacy is quasi-symmetric, in order to show our quasi-symmetric rigidity theorem, all we have to do is to construct dynamic, a dynamically defined fine grid associated to each multicritical circle map, okay? Now, so the, po the point is that, you know, you might say, well, let's start with the dynamical partitions. Maybe they, they, they will work. Well, first there is a minor defect that uh, Pn plus 1 is not a strict refinement of Pn because every long atom of Pn, okay, is broken, but the short atoms of Pn become the long atoms of Pn plus 1. So it's not a strict refinement already. So you might say, well, just skip, you know, you, you consider P1, P3, P5, and so on. Maybe they do form a fine grid. They don't because the ANs of the continuous fraction, they can be very large, and they determine how many uh, sub-intervals intervals will be in the long atoms at the next step. So uh, the dynamics here is like this. This interval I sub N plus 1 here, this one, you know, it's mapped over here. By, by, the map, by the map FQN. So FQN takes this interval to this interval. And then FQN plus 1, which is the return map here, will just move this interval like this. Okay? So this, this is like a fundamental domain for the dynamics on the side. And the number of intervals that you see here, up until you get to the next return, this number of intervals here is precisely the number AN plus 1. So if AN plus 1 is very, very big, the, there will be too many intervals. You don't have a fine grid. So this means that you, you know, in order to construct a fine grid, you have to come somehow, you have to sort of uh, combine these atoms together. You have to, to, to put some of these guys together in, in a subtle way. So, so um, first you modify the partitions Pn. So you take Pn and you look at the long atoms and you partition the long atoms in the following way. So uh, like in this picture here, you see there are some moments where you have critical points. These moments where you have critical points, I call critical spots, okay? So, uh, and, I, and the, uh, the fundamental domains are ordered. So this is the first fundamental domain, and then you have the next, the next, the next. So the, these k sub i's are the times that you have to iterate fqn plus 1 to have a critical point, okay? So I call these intervals critical spots, okay? I, and I also, for abuse, I call this guy a critical spot even though in general it does not have a critical point there, but anyway. So these are the critical spots, and the, the, the unions of fundamental domains for the dynamics in between two adjacent uh, critical spots I call a bridge. So there are critical spots and bridges. The number of critical spots is at most the number of critical points for the original map, so there are boundedly many of those. So there are boundedly many bridges also. And the lemma, the fundamental lemma says that these bridges I mean, the, the, these critical spots, they have to be comparable to the big interval containing them, okay? So they have to be, there's a picture like this. So this is a dy dynamical picture. So here's a critical spot. Here's the next critical spot. The dynamics is going like this. These intervals here in the middle can be very tiny, but these have to be comparable to the, the one that contains it. This is, a, this is the nice key lemma, okay, that we, we prove. And th this amounts to a... a, a, a 
a nice uh, application of quasi uh, uh, cross ratio distortion. Okay, it's very nice. So you modify these partitions, the partition PN, by refining uh, the long intervals. This, this is an, a long interval. You refine it by putting these, these, these intervals there. And you get a partition that I call PN star. So you, 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 refine it, you refine it here at the level of the return map, and then you map it forward to get a, a refinement for the whole partition and the whole circle. So you get this thing. This is now finer than PN, but it's still coarser than the next one. These partitions still do not form a fine grid, so you have to modify it still further. Uh, so here's this fundamental lemma I just mentioned to you. These critical spots are comparable, and therefore the bridges, as long as they're non-empty, they're also comparable okay, to the interval that contains it. So you still have to modify the PN stars a little further, and the way to do this is using uh, uh, a lemma of Yoko's, which has to do with almost parabolic maps. So you have a diffeomorphism, which has negative Schwarzen, and uh, has the dynamics is like in this picture. It translates, it translates the intervals. You know, there's a fundamental domain which is moved, say, to the left or to the right, doesn't matter. Okay? All is in the same direction. And uh, it has uh, negative Schwarzen derivatives. So m most definitely, I'm not talking about this full map here. This doesn't have a negative Schwarzen. Okay? But we can prove that uh, the map restricted to the bridges the FQN plus one restricted to uh, uh, bridges are, have negative Schwarzen, okay? So we can apply this result of Yoko's that says that every time you have such a situation, you know, a negative Schwarzen diffeomorphism which behaves like a translation uh, uh, topologically, then, you know, the, if you're marching along this, if you're marching along this, this, this map, you know, so you have a fundamental domain and you keep marching like this. So the, at the kth iterate, before you reach the, the middle here where, where, you, where, you, where you almost have a saddle node, the kth iterate here, the length of the interval that you see here is 1 over k square, is of the order of 1 over k square times the length of the big interval, okay? That's the fundamental uh, estimate of Yoko's. And the constants that go into there and this is important uh, in the theory. The constants, the, co the, the constants, so here's the result by Yoko's. These J, J's are these intervals. I called them delta in the previous picture, but here I'm talking about an abstract situation. So you have. Presume, could be, I mean, I don't know, okay? It, it, we don't, in our, in our case, we, we're proving that it is quasi-symmetric, so that's all we are doing. We're not proving it's absolutely continuous or anything like that. So, sorry, sorry. Yes, that's why I stated it like this, because it's from both sides, okay? So, and this constant that comes in here depends only on, you see, you have the, you have the initial and the final fundamental domains, and you compare the lengths of the initial and the final fundamental domains with the length of the whole interval. This is this constant sigma I'm talking about. And the only dependence in the estimate is on this constant sigma. So it depends on the space that you have in the beginning, at the end, but it does not depend on how many iterates you have in the middle. Okay, this is important. So using this lemma, we can take a bridge and we can decompose. I'm going to skip the technical uh, explanation. I'll give you the picture. Here's the picture. So you take a bridge. The bridge is a union of a lot of fundamental domains. So the way you decompose the bridge is as follows. L0 and R0 here on the, uh, uh, you know, on the left and on the right, they are, they are one fundamental domain, one fundamental domain. L1 and R1 are formed by two fundamental domains. L2 and R2 are formed by four fundamental domains and so on. So you keep going like that until, as, for as long as you can until you reach the middle. So you have these lateral intervals. You have these lateral intervals, you have these you know, left uh, right intervals, and you have this one in the middle. This decomposition, L0, union L1, etc., union M sub D plus 1, union R sub 0, R sub 1, and so on. This is, uh, uh, the, this is the decomposition of the bridge, okay? And now, using this decomposition, you can construct a fine grid, but still, it's going to be a bit subtle. I'm not going to give you the details. The construction of the fine grid actually uses atoms or unions of atoms from various levels. So if you're at the level if you're working, 
if you're defining the nth partition of the fine grid, the partition that I call Qn, you have to use various p sub k's for various values of k's. Okay? You, 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 it's, it's more subtle than it seems. So it's actually given by uh, 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 an inductive procedure. This, this proposition is an adaptation to the multicritical case of something that already appeared in my first paper with Wellington. Okay? There we didn't have to deal, you know, we didn't have these critical points to worry about. So anyway. So, and once you construct a fine grid, then the, the theorem, the main theorem that I stated before follows, okay? So just to end my talk, yeah, there's some references here. So to end my talk, I'll just give you an idea of how to prove the result that I have with uh, Pablo, okay? So this, just give you a very rough idea of how you can uh, prove, prove that in this situation, I mean, how you can get the conjugacy not to be quasi-symmetric. So the secret is precisely at this, at this level. So suppose you're looking at, a, so I'm going to look at a map that has one critical point and, and then there is another map, G. So F has just this one critical point. So I look at the uh, uh, nth renormalization. Okay, so here's the interval I sub n plus 1. Here's the interval I sub n for F, okay? Here I have a, a critical point C1, which is going to be the image by the conjugacy. C0 goes to C1. But there is another critical point. You have to remember that there is another one here on this side. This map has two critical points. So if you're looking at the return map here, so you start iterating this interval, for instance. So it goes around and so on, and uh, uh, it maybe hits the critical point and comes here. Or maybe it doesn't hit the critical point and gets here. But then when you start iterating it under FQN plus 1, and you go around, I mean, you trade by F, 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 QN plus one times, you may hit the critical point, and there will be a critical spot here. So there will be some image of the other critical point here. And let's say that it happens at a time K sub N. So K sub N is the time, in, you know, in this dynamics here, in this uh, uh, translation dynamics that you have here, right? This fundamental domain. So it, it happens to land exactly in the K sub N th, um, um, uh, fundamental domain, okay? All right, so uh, the result we proved, right, says that this interval cannot be too small. So this picture is actually wrong. It should have been something like this. Here's I sub n. The interval that contains the critical point is here. The first fundamental domain is here. So this is delta zero. This is delta sub k sub n. And there's a bunch of intervals here in the middle which can be very small, okay? But there's these four points here. This point, this point, this point, and this point, they have a definite cross ratio, okay? Whereas on this side, whereas on this side, the conjugacy will map this uh, k sub nth uh, uh, fundamental domain into the k sub nth fundamental domain here because the two maps are conjugate, right? However, if k sub n is big compared to a sub n, okay? I mean, it cannot be too big because it has to be it has to be more or less in the middle. In other words, if this is bounded away from zero and from one by two constants, and if this happens at infinitely many scales, if there are infinitely many values of n for which this happened, what we'll have you, you have this, you have this four tuple of points which have a very small cross ratio mapped to this situation which has a definite cross ratio. So you have unbounded distortion of cross ratios, therefore the conjugacy cannot be quasi-symmetric. So that's the basic idea. And so what you have to do now, you have to, you have to adjust the rotation number so that you have infinitely many visits of the critical point to the middle where you almost have a settled node. And in order to do that, we have to study a certain skew product because when you have a map with two critical points, there's two invariants to, 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 to worry about. There is the rotation number and there is also the measure, the invariant measure, we call alpha, of the interval joining the two critical points, say one of the two intervals that joins the critical point. So you have to study how the renormalization operator, the renormalization scheme that we have, how does it affect this alpha? The rotation number is just moved by the Gauss map, just you know, shift in the continued fraction expansion. 
but the alpha moves in a funny way that you have to compute. So what you get is like a skew product over the, um, over the Gauss map. Okay, so you have a skew product over the Gauss map, and you, we can show that this, this is topologically mixing. But we, we would like to understand the invariant measures so we could actually show that it's a, you know, uh, ergodic or mixing or whatever. So then we would transform our set B in the statement of the theorem from, uh, from, from, from being a, a, a generic in the topological sense to being full measure, okay? But we can't do that yet. Maybe we will be able to do it shortly, yeah? So I think I'll stop here, so. Sorry.